it's the ultimate test of time. How would old-school trains stand up against the ones we have today? Is there even any comparing? You might be surprised. The grandpappies of locomotives have their own victories if you ask me. But more on that later. For now, full steam ahead, uh, back to the past. Rail cars were used in some parts of England as far back as the early 1500s. They were mostly for carrying coal or unrefined metals out of mines or onto ships. The first real trains didn't come along until the locomotion number no. 1 made its maiden journey in 1825. This early engine looked like a barrel on wheels, and the little 400-foot train chugged along at a leisurely 15 miles per hour. Small and slow, but it did manage to haul about 600 passengers on its opening day. Fast forward 100 years, and trains were the kings of long-distance travel. For example, there's the jolly green giant known as the Flying Scotsman. It has more to its name than a brief cameo in the wizarding world of Harry Potter. Built almost a century after the locomotion number no. 1, the engine car of the Flying Scotsman is nearly 80 feet long and weighs over 100 tons. Compare that to locomotion's number no. 1 measly 7-ton engine car. With a maximum speed of 100 miles per hour, a race between the two wouldn't even be a fair contest. But what about the trains of today? Well, diesel trains date back to the late 1800s, but only really started to come into their own in the 1950s. Modern diesel trains aren't that much faster than those of the Scotsman's generation. The quickest diesel locomotives in the world are the British Inner City 125s. In service since the 1970s, these trains were designed to travel at 125 miles per hour but have been known to reach speeds of up to 148 miles per hour when pushed to their limits. That's a maximum speed comparable to some light aircraft. Diesel trains are also much more efficient than their steam predecessors. Steam engines burn coal or wood to boil water. The steam is collected inside the body of the engine and used to turn the wheels that push it forward. The problem? It takes a lot of pressure to move a train, so coal-powered engines needed time to warm up before they were ready to go meaning too much coal had to be burnt before the train could start moving. The excess steam also needed to be released when the train arrived, which meant so much built-up energy going to waste. Making matters worse, steam engines were dirty, so the boilers required a thorough cleaning at least once a month. The engines also needed to be partially disassembled as part of regular maintenance. Diesel engines are much cleaner and less prone to breaking down. In the 1930s, a typical steam train could spend as much as 65% of its time offline for maintenance. A diesel engine from the same era only had to spend 5% of its time in the garage. And that number has only continued to shrink over the decades. But if you want to talk about speed and efficiency, that would be electric. One of the fastest trains operating today is the SNCV TGV POS. Hey, buy a Val, will ya? <laughs> Its name may be a tongue-twisting jumble of letters, but these sleek locomotives are capable of a blistering 200 miles per hour. There are a few reasons electric trains are able to achieve such cheap flapping speeds, but weight is one of the biggest. Most diesel trains are actually diesel-electric. That means the engine produces electricity, which is then used to power the motors that drive the train forward. Electric trains only need the motor to turn the wheels. Since they get all their power from the electrical grid, they also don't need to worry about carrying the weight of fuel. Electric trains are also quieter and completely emission-free. They can even produce some of their own power through a system known as regenerative braking. Simply put, this means that as the train slows down, the electric motors can work as electrical generators. The energy they produce can then be put back into the railway electrical grid. Removing the diesel engines also cuts down on the number of moving parts. Fewer parts mean fewer things that can break, which cuts down on maintenance time. The only real downside is the upfront cost of electrifying a pre-existing rail network. But that's the kind of problem that's only an issue once. Then, there are maglev trains, which use magnets to hover or levitate above the tracks. Futuristic, fast, and quiet, they have all the benefits of conventional electric trains. They're also immune to derailments, and the lack of wheels means they don't experience friction, which lets them travel at a much greater speed than is possible on standard tracks. As of 2019, 
the fastest train in the world is the SC Maglev, which can reach an incredible maximum speed of 375 miles per hour. Hope you weren't planning on seeing this bad boy for yourself anytime soon. Unfortunately, the track it's going to run on isn't scheduled to open until 2027 and won't be 100 complete until 2042. The problem is that maglev trains can't run on regular tracks. An entirely new rail system must be built for them, and that comes with a hefty price tag. Not everyone's convinced the benefits of maglev trains outweigh the cost. But what do you think? Or more generally, how is the rail system in your country? Long overdue for an upgrade? <laughs> Let me know down in the comments. Now, speed and efficiency are important and all, but what's it like to ride on these machines? And how does that compare to our old barrel on wheels from earlier? Yeah, the first generations of trains weren't very fun to ride on. Oh, I'm sure there was a lot of excitement the first time you saw a giant metal horse stampeding down the tracks. But that childlike wonder with a dash of fear wore off if you were planning to ride for more than a few hours. The first train cars resembled carriages or stagecoaches and didn't offer much protection from the smoke billowing from the engine. They were as unsafe as they were uncomfortable. The cars sometimes banged together when stopping, and passengers were often thrown from their seats. The engine also tended to throw off sparks or hot embers that could cause a fire. Glass half full? <laughs> it didn't take too long for train cars to develop into something more recognizable. Half empty? They weren't much more comfortable. Are you in Chicago and want to visit family on the East Coast? Well, get ready to spend up to two days sitting on a hard wooden bench. Things would improve in 1862, when the Pullman Company started producing luxury sleeper cars. And I don't use the word luxury lightly. The cars had upholstered seats, carpeting, and lacquered wood. Beds were concealed behind overhead panels and folded down like luggage compartments. The Pullman Company even manufactured private luxury cars, basically hotel suites on wheels. There you go, Pappy, your victory. Or not. Modern train cars are still much safer and more comfortable than anything from the 19th century. Although, anyone who rides the subway to work might have trouble believing that. Depending on where you live, the subway is the best or worst part of city living. Long-distance trains, on the other hand, can feel like the lap of luxury. The seats on modern passenger trains are similar to ones on many airliners. The difference is that they don't need seat belts, and you're free to get up and walk around whenever you feel like it. Private rail cars are rare in the modern world, but sleeper cars are alive and well. Depending on the route, your train might come equipped with anything from a small cafe or snack bar to its own gourmet restaurant. And of course, most passenger trains come equipped with the greatest necessity of modern living. Free Wi-Fi. Ooh. All aboard! <laughs> Hey, if you learned something new today, then give the video a like and share it with a friend. And here are some other cool videos I think you'll enjoy. Just click to the left or right. And remember, stay on the bright side of life.